by the nine and four. Welcome to the library, where today we're taking a look at one of the creatures of the realms, the Hum Snatcher, or as some people know it, name it, the Forest Reaper. One of Jamamar's very own cryptids, mostly unknown and little understood by a few, but feared by many more. As my perceptive patrons and regular visitors are already aware, but for new guests to the library, this will be but a brief look at this most interesting, if mostly misunderstood, of creatures. As always, a more in-depth examination is totally possible in the future if there is interest, so let me know what directions you would like our explorations to go in. To many of the people of Jamamar, Hum snatchers are a rumor, or something that's only found in the lawless lands, deep in the forests and the ore wood groves at their core. Many of the stories of them are thought to, well, be instead tales about prey cons or other creatures that were not seen clearly. The hums that are part of their name and calling card are oft dismissed as just the noise of the woods, playing on the nerves of the foolish or drunk. Moving on to what is known, or at least rumored about the creature, the hum snatcher is thought to be a flightless bird, roughly four to five and a half foot tall and weighing in at about 150 pounds, a sizable creature that is very quick extraordinarily nimble, and apparently very clever. Staying out of sight in many if not most cases where an encounter is possible or even likely, their presence is said to be accompanied by an audio phenomenon, most commonly described as a hum. Now. Accounts differ on if it's a deep hum, like the resonance of dread that floats across a catacomb, or if it is of a higher pitch, like the whine that comes from too much noise all crashing together at once. In either case, accounts that also actually encountered the hum snatcher itself make notes of various clicking noises in random seeming patterns most often when found in close proximity to one of their kills. These hums and clicks are well known enough in the areas that these birds supposedly inhabit, however, that children and most adults will know well enough to leave the area before running afoul of the reapers of the forest. The few reports that actually include a direct visual description are surprisingly consistent in their facts. Height and general size match, with the exceptions appearing to be perhaps younglings. They also seem to be of a very dark feather colorations, perhaps consisting of greens or browns in their darker and more subdued tones, which would be perfect for moving with speed in the various shadows and undergrowth of the forest. The presence of a pair of head crests or growths of some kind are the defining feature of nearly all the visual descriptions of the bird. As they seem to each surround one of the bird's eyes and are described as having slots, holes, or perhaps vents in their structure. There are some reports of pairs of the creatures, presumably mates, inhabiting a specific area. However, it appears that they are aggressively territorial among their own kind, as occasionally cadavers recovered do appear to be that of the legendary hum snatcher, but always without the head or neck. The reasons for this are unknown, perhaps this is how they prove their worthiness to a mate, or perhaps the creature consumes it as some part of metabiological function or a sign of dominance over a territory. They have almost all been seen over the body of some fresh kill, tearing into it with both their oversized and sharp beaks, as well as long talons capable of parting even dragon hide, according to some reports. 
Almost all the reports of this nature are heavily tinted and blurred by the individual's fear, horror, and general disorientation and confusion of what they are witnessing, amplified by the general sensations that are felt as one gets closer to the hum snatcher. At some point, after the bird has gotten its fill, presumably, with a final strike of its beak, it will take something from the kill. What it takes is not known, only that the clicks and sensations are at their most intense in these instances without fail in all descriptions, and the beak of the creature will glow with a faint ethereal light. This glow is often lost under the viscera and blood of the hum snatcher's kill, but can be seen in most cases. As soon as this happens, the creature will run off into the woods, with its hums resounding and echoing long after it is no longer there. Many speculate that this is the final life force, or the soul of the animal or other kill, and is the cause of much of the fear of these creatures and their dangerous habitats. This part of reports is where the bird earns its Reaper of the Forest title, as well as the popular belief that the creature is just a myth, as no concrete proof of the creature has been found. No whole cadaver, or one that includes the neck and head with its incredibly well-described crest, has ever been recovered. What the hum snatcher is and where it comes from is a mystery that has never been examined in too great of a depth, mostly because of the creature's preference to be left alone. They will evade and avoid interaction with anything that is not their mate or their young, or an aggressive interloper of their own kind. While many consider the hum snatcher a myth, most accept that such a creature is likely to exist, as the realms are, if nothing else, quite varied in its strangeness. There are very few who actually have solid information about these creatures, their nature, and perhaps how they came to be. And surprisingly, this is not either the dragons or the Analar who possess this information. But instead, this lore comes to us via the records of the Revivers, who early after the appearance of these creatures, began to study them in earnest, for reasons we shall get into presently. Because why would a burgeoning group of Chris Tech nerds and researchers take interest in what at the time was only wild rumor of forest-dwelling, soul-eating birds? Because the revivers had a hunch of what the bird was really after, and thus, what was driving its behavior. From the records made available, the first appearances of the hum snatcher is in the waning years of the reign, and perhaps the early years of the age after. And it is assumed that the creature was at one point an experiment of some sort during those wild and insane times. This is assumed due to the bird's quality, and in the way in which it has adapted to them. Because you see, the hum snatcher is in no way a carnivore, and in fact dines on the various plants and fungi in the woods, actually preferring the fungi that grow from the bark of ore wood trees particularly. The sightings of the bird tearing apart cadavers has in fact nothing to do with the creature trying to obtain food or nourishment but instead to obtain a particular shiny and glittering item left in the cadaver after the creature's death, namely, Crist. The crest around the and above the eyes of a hum snatcher serve as some sort of crist detecting organ, which will guide the bird towards the crist that has manifested within the bodies of the freshly dead. This appeared to be accomplished via the clicking that is often heard when they are seen near a cadaver. Once they find the cadaver and 
figure out where the crest is within it. Their sharp beak and talons make quick, if bloody and extraordinarily messy, work of exposing the crest. And then the hump snatcher takes it and rushes back to their nest to store it. The flickering gem-like stone in its beak initiating the glow that is so often described. The crests also seem to be the source of the humming that is so common in this presence, and this effect seems to be nearly always active as long as the bird is awake and moving in any way. The often contradicting accounts of the creature's effect is in fact due to the sex of the hum snatcher being encountered. Males, who are mostly active at night, produce a low tone that engenders fear, anxiety, and paranoia. Whereas females, active most during the day, will produce a slightly higher tone. But the confusion and disorientation that it creates in a subject tends to morph the sound into an overwhelming cacophony of sound. Furthermore, Exposure to the plumage of the inner wings of a hum snatcher will create a similar effect but much more potent and severe in its form. This occurs even if not in lighting conditions that would normally allow someone to see the plumage in the first place. And this ability will often see animals and people flee very carelessly. Sometimes ending in death but not due to the hum snatcher directly, of course, but just the dangers inherent in the woods that they live in and how running in them, fleeing carelessly and afraid, can lead one to be simply tripped by a root and disabled by a broken bone, perhaps to bleed out and create a crist in its passing, which would attract the bird which would potentially set up a repeat of the process. However, this seems to only be deployed if the hum snatcher is in danger or interrupted while it is receiving a crisp. It's trying to return to its home with a crisp or in the core area of its territory. These traits made further study of the bird very difficult, but not beyond the growing capabilities of the revivers. And eventually, the rhyme and reason behind the life cycle and actions of the hump snatcher were more fully discovered. The chris that are obtained are kept within the nests of the hump snatcher, which are large and built up hollows of mud and soil, often packed very tightly two to three inches thick on the walls and covered on the outside with fallen and self-plucked feathers of the bird, making the nest appear to be five to seven foot high and wide hollow tree trunks with the entrances hidden behind feathered false walls. These nests are where all but the smallest type one Chris will find themselves kept pressed into the inside walls of the home built by the hum snatcher. Type 1 crisps are kept in a small pile in the center of a nest, in a slight depression or hole, and will be used as part of courting and procreation, as well as in the hatching of any eggs. They also seem to be handed down generationally to whichever of the descendants managed to claim the hollow of their parents after their death, although this seems to tend to be a bloodless affair between siblings. When a female or a male comes across the nest of a hump snatcher of the opposite sex, often doing so by the abilities of their crest detecting the collection of the other, they will engage in a series of dances of sorts, and this always involves the visitor entering and leaving the nest of the other, and then either trying to slay the other for its crest, or to rush off to begin moving their collection to that of their new mate. Occasionally, subjects will bring the potential mate to their nest and repeat the process. When this occurs, 
Often, both nests will end up being destroyed and a new, larger nest, fully built from the collections of both, will be made. If a nest is found without the occupant present, then the interloper will attempt to steal the biggest and the shiniest of the crisp before fleeing with their prize. Two hum snatchers of the same sex that encounter one another that are not siblings will almost always end in either a violent battle or, more likely, immediate withdrawal from both and the avoidance of the potential challenger. So long as any potential challenger is not infringing on the other's core territory. Such infringements always end with the death of one, if not both, of the hum snatchers. Type 1 crisps are ingested as part of both the mating and fertilization rites for the hum snatchers, and then, after the three to six weeks that the eggs are in their incubation period, a type 1 crisp is required to hatch each egg. This allows the eggs to remain in a stasis for up to three months after incubation before it is too late to successfully hatch the young. All other Chris gathered are used as internal decoration for the hum snatcher's nest, to better attract a mate with the glittering and shimmering of various larger and exotic types of Chris. And this, of course, is the reason why the revivers were so interested in the creature as they were a collection system for all the Chris that formed naturally in the woods that would never wise be found. The first nest found was revealed to hold over 5 million standard gold pieces in Chris, and if not for the immediate reprisal, consisting of every known member of the species and more in the local region converging on the team's location and slaughtering them, um, Snatchers would be a great source of Chris for this shadowy and hidden organization. How such a coordinated and heavy-handed response was possible is still not known or understood. However, after the incident, efforts to locate any nests that were not inhabited became the priority and goal. With teams looking in areas where the creature's corpse had been reported to be found or similar stories becoming common. The lack of a head or neck on discovered cadavers of hum snatchers seems to be the result of the crests breaking down after death in a process that also results in the melting of the rest of the head and most of the neck in a rapid form of decay. This is assumed to be yet another feature or quirk of however the first of these creatures was created. However, it also became very clear that hum snatchers were very, very clever, along the lines of crows or ravens, often being observed using their abilities to cause creatures to act in ways that benefited themselves, often with multiple steps, such as first scaring a deer into the open so it can be slain so the hum snatcher can remain hidden and undiscovered then scaring away the hunter until it can claim any formed crisp, leaving the carcass for the hunter should he return. Using their abilities in such a way that they are exposed as little as possible, including leading interlopers away from a kill or a nest, all with the goal of not coming under direct observation, and if so, just exposing the unfortunate trespassers to their underwings and ensuring the threat is most likely fleeing in despair or left overwhelmed and panicked, trying to escape something they don't understand in a place they no longer can make sense of, only trying to get away from the noise. While some nest recoveries have been successful over the ages, they are rare events and most choose not to make the attempt. More successful is finding an unhatched egg and then hatching it personally. After nearly a year training the creature to be a companion, the efforts are at best a flip of the coin in chances of success. 
However, the loyalty of a hum snatcher properly raised is for life, which in captivity seems to be tied to the length of life of its bonded, with elven examples living for centuries, but halfling bondings merely lasting decades. And they will seek out Chris for their owner as if they were a mate or young, always attempting to increase the size of the collection while allowing pieces of Chris to be taken by their bonded. Also, due to the manner of hatching in the hand of their owner, it seems that in that action, an immunity to the emotional projection powers of the Humstringer seems to be imparted between the youngling and their new owner. Also, and curiously, if the bonded owner has a family or close compatriots and raises the hum snatcher alongside them or in their presence, this immunity or a strong resistance similar to it seems to be imparted to them as well. However, for reasons unknown, no hum snatcher hatched outside their nest will turn out to be fertile, regardless of sex. All artificially hatched, or even hum snatchers in captivity, will not reproduce. Attempting to hold a wild hum snatcher in captivity is a fool's errand at best, and will result in an ever more violent creature until it is released back into its woods. Thus, further study of the creature has been lacking as they were too territorial and feral for the revivers to make use of them due to a final quirk. Perhaps due to their own abilities of emotional manipulation, the hum snatcher is all but immune to direct and overt coercion and control, magical or chemical, and displays only the mildest susceptibility to some illusions. This, combined with the fact that the woods that they prefer are far from most people, groups, and cities that would try to take advantage of their magpie nature if it was known, all goes a long way to keeping the hum snatcher a thing of rumor or myth for most, and a thing of angst and confusion for those that cross their paths. And this is where we shall end our look at the Hum Snatcher, one of the lesser known or understood creatures of the realms. I hope you now have a better understanding of them and their place in the strange order of Jamamar's wild and dark woods. Clever and capable of great acts of violence, we should be grateful that the big birds seldom seek to leave their forests in which they do reside and that they seem more fearful than not of civilization. If they were not so timid, they could, in enough numbers, easily overrun a small village or a hamlet. And what might happen if they figure out how much Chris attends to be even in a small hamlet is a possibility that no one should want to see played out. With all that said, I want to thank you as always, my new guests, as well as my regular visitors and perceptive patrons for your time, your interest, and your support. Now, until you next make your way back to the library for another entry, I have been the recorder, and by the nine and four, be well, take care of yourselves and each other. If you'd like to contribute to the further exploration and explanation of the realms, please consider leaving a comment, a like, and sharing the video around. I read all the comments and make efforts to reply to each. Thank you for helping to grow the channel and know I look forward to each and every one of your comments. Other methods of support can be found in the channel's description. Thank you for watching.